I appreciate everyone's patience as we were getting this started. I'm sorry that we're starting a little bit late, but welcome to our Knowledge as Pollinator Power webinar. I know that you guys have probably heard all about this from various and different channels, and, and it has been um, a long time in the making. So thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, go ahead and move on. Um, so this, uh, you've probably read that this is a kind of a pollinator pep rally for the Great Southeast Pollinator Census. Um, and this is the first year that it has it is happening in North Carolina. Um, and so today we're going to actually hear from our experts first uh, to get you pumped up for counting insects. Um, I'm super stoked to have everybody, but this would not be possible without um, this team of lovely ladies. So Charlotte Glenn is the state coordinator for the Extension Master Gardener Program in North Carolina, and Regina is the program assistant for the for the Master Gardener Program. And um, the uh, and my name is Amanda Wilkins. I'm the one you've been getting all the emails from. Um, so, and I'm the horticulture agent in Lee County with North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Um, so, thank you all for being here today. Next slide. So a few things, I know that because we were a little delayed on how we were getting everything started, um, this is a webinar, so it's a little different than maybe what you might be used to experiencing in Zoom. Usually folks are doing meetings, but the, the webinar is a little different. So the way that a webinar works is there are two kind of ways to interact with the panelists who are the people that you can see. These are the folks who are going to be speaking today. So we can't see you and, and you can't talk. Um, that's um, if you want to, um, at the end, we will be able to unmute you. But for right now, we're just focusing on the things that we're going on. Um, but the Q&A section, so if you have a question, there is a, um, a place to click Q&A. If you have a question, put it there. If you want to, if you want to just um, make a comment on something that somebody said, or share a story, or say hi, which please do say hi where you're coming from, um, uh, that is going to go in the chat. So questions go in the Q and A. Everything else goes in the webinar chat. Um, that's the distinction. We can, um, we are actually saving all of the chat and all of the questions and answers, so we can send out the questions and answers later. Um, the session is being recorded, so if you have to duck out early, um, if you didn't quite catch something that somebody said, you can go back and watch this. Um, after the webinar is over, I will be um, staying a little bit later tonight trying to finish up and clean this video up. It will be posted on our YouTube um, channel, and we will send it out to the same email that we sent the Zoom information to, so um, rest assured you are going to be able to watch it again and share it with whoever you'd like to. Um, we will answer questions. Um, I know some of the questions might be, we might be able to answer them um, during, while everybody's speaking. Um, and we will share some of those questions and answers with everyone at the end. We'll also have some time, hopefully at the end of everything to talk about the cool ideas that um, folks are, um, doing with the census. Um, I know that there are quite a few um, Extension Master Gardener programs across the state that are doing events. Um, um, so I'm very excited to see how this is taking off. Okay, Charlotte. So the purpose of this webinar, I know that there are a lot of webinars out there um, that kind of have these pollinator themes. Pollinators seem to be really, really big right now for, um, gardeners and horticulturists and naturalists, um, and which is great. We need to raise awareness about that. And Matt and Denisha and Hannah are going to talk a lot more about what that what that means in the context of science and for you as folks living in the environment. But um, so we are going to learn more about insects and how to study, identify, and provide resources in your garden for pollinators and other insects, insects, insects. We're going to introduce the Great Southeast Pollinator Census and explain um, how to participate in the census. We're going to share with you some resources to help you um, participate in the census wherever you are, as well as to help conserve pollinators. Experiencing the census is just one thing that you can do, but there's lots of things that you can do even in your own backyard and in your community. Um, we're going to discuss some ideas of how to 
um, bring the Great Southeast Pollinator Census to your community. And then I'm just really excited. I'm already excited. I hope you're excited, but hopefully by the end, everybody will be excited. So next slide. <laughs> um, quick shout out to everyone. So like I, for, for those of y'all who weren't here at the very beginning, we had more than 400 people sign up for the, the webinar, which is a record for me. Um, it surpassed, far surpasses the, um, the uh, webinar back in June, which I will link to for those of y'all who missed it. Um, but uh, so 400 folks, and just to think that 400 people touching one other person, that's 800 people potentially talking about pollinators. So that's just really amazing to me. And most of the folks who registered are Extension Master Gardener volunteers and Extension professionals, more than 50%. Um, but there is a whole host of other people, 45% of the people who registered for this webinar um, are not affiliated with Cooperative Extension. And I love the folks who shared their stories and their experiences with pollinators. We have lots of folks who have community pollinators, lots of educators who are talking to their communities about, about um, pollinator conservation and gardening. Um, we got to have a couple of folks who are participating in the Xerxes Society Southeast Bumblebee Atlas Project. Um, lots of lovers of native plants and nectar plants. Um, and I know that it's not a positive thing, but we do have some concerned citizens who are here to educate themselves and hopefully bring that education to their community. Um, I'm very excited to see that there are a lot of folks who are interested in reducing their lawn footprint and introducing more meadow systems into their landscapes. Um, and this is this is a program and a concept that I've been talking about with a couple of other um, extension agents. Um, so stay tuned to some extension programming. There might be some stuff coming out soon more about that. So for those of y'all who are not familiar with extension, I, I do have to do a wee shout out because I do work for them. So NC State Cooperative Extension is a program, a joint program between NCA and T and NC State University. Um, this is a, they are land grant universities. And so their job is to extend, our job is to extend research-based knowledge to all North Carolinians mm -hmm. to help them transform science into everyday solutions and improve their lives and grow our state. Um, and our job is to really be a resource for research-based information. So if you have a problem or you want to learn more about something, we are here um, to help you. We don't charge a fee for it. It is a service um, that we provide freely to all of the citizens of North Carolina. Next slide. And I do have to do a shout out to the Extension Master Gardener program out of NC State. Um, I'm really excited that Charlotte and the Extension agents in North Carolina uh, agreed to take this on as an Extension Master Gardener statewide program. Mm -hmm. And there are Extension, there are Master Gardener groups across the state of North Carolina from the mountains to the sea that are taking this on um, within their programming. And that is so cool to me. Um, and for those of y'all who have heard of Extension Master Gardeners or may not have heard of them, their mission is to connect people to horticulture through science-based education and outreach that empowers North Carolinians to cultivate healthy plants, landscapes, ecosystems, and communities. Um, and so they are here to support um, consumer horticulture and horticulture in general agents within the counties. And so most count, there are quite a few counties across the state that have extension master gardener programs and their whole goal is to educate the community about all these things. Yep. So without further ado, uh, you're not here to listen to me. <laughs> you're here to listen to all these wonderful folks. Um, and so real quick, I am going to, um, I'm going to exit full screen because I'm going to read everybody's lovely bios that they sent me. Um, and y'all, I'm gonna introduce all of the um, panelists first. So everybody's gonna get their um, introduction out of the way. And then we, um, and then Denisha, I will let you start. Once you finish, um, Hannah, you're gonna go. And then once you finish, Matt, you're gonna go. And again, just a reminder to all of our attendees out there, um, if you have questions for these folks, put them in the question and answer section, not the chat section. Um, so Dr. Denisha Seth Carley is a research associate professor in the Department of Horticultural Science at NC State 
as well as the director for the Center for Integrated Pest Management and the Center for Excellence for Regulatory Science and Agriculture, which is also at state. Her area of expertise is sustainable managed urban landscapes with a focus on horticult on pollinator, pollinator health. Research and extension programs include quali pollen quality and commonly planted wildflowers, pollinator e ecology along roadsides in North Carolina, and native plant conservation and pollinator habitat establishment at the historic Pinehurst number two and number four golf courses. And our second speaker is going to be Dr. Hannah Levinson. Uh, she is a community ecologist interested in investigating how humans impact the environment and exploring ways to mitigate those impacts. She uses pollinators in agricultural settings with concepts of integrated pest and pollinator management as tools to research these interactions. Hannah is a bee expert with experience researching both native bees and honeybees in, US, in the U.S. and international settings. Currently, as the head of the Specialty Crops Integrative Pest and Pollinator Management Laboratory, she is working closely with blackberry growers across, the North Carolina, across North Carolina to make the management of an invasive fruit fly, the spotted wing drosophila, more sustainable and to better understand how management decisions may impact pollinators. And finally, last but certainly not least, Dr. Matt Bertone is the director and entomologist at the North Carolina State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. He specializes in the identification of insects and other arthropods, a service he provides to various clients and stakeholders. Matt is also interested in the taxonomy, evolution, and natural history of these organisms, as well as capturing images of them through digital macro photography, which y'all are in for a treat. He has some amazing photos. So without further ado, Charlotte, if you will unshare your screen, um, I think Hannah, you should be able to share your slides. Hopefully. Denisha is going first. Oh, Denisha. Denisha is going first. Go for it. And you should be able to share, hopefully. <laughs> I am not able to share. Okay. Because yeah. your day wasn't already yep. complicated enough. There, yeah. Well, you know, let's see. All right. I got it. There now. we go. Somebody gave me permission. I guess I just looked like trouble. Let me. Well, uh, <laughs> hey, it would not be it would not be a statewide program without some technical difficulties. All right, so I'm I have got two screens I'm working with. Can you guys see only my my primary slide, or do you see my primary slide and my notes? Hannah's we giving me. We just see your up. primary slide. You're good to go. Fantastic. Thank you all. I've only been doing this for what three years. You'd think I'd get it right by now. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I am super stoked to be here today. And uh, I have way more slides than I am supposed to have time for. So I'm going to just jump right in. I think that Amanda gave me this title, and it is absolutely my favorite title in the whole wide world. So I kept it. My talk is, uh, even though I, we are prepping for the pollinator census, my talk is pollinator plants of awesomeness. And because we are talking about pollinators, and I am going to be transitioning very soon to those plants of awesomeness that I mentioned, but I wanted to just sort of uh, give us all the uh, starting point and get all on the same page. My favorite uh, pollinators are bees, and to dig just a tiny bit deeper, my favorite pollinators within the bee group are bumblebees. Don't worry, you don't have to remember that. There is not a quiz, but I do tend, when I'm talking about my favorite plants, to get so excited, and I only say, oh, these are good for bees. But when I say that, I don't really just mean bees. I mean pollinators in general. What do we mean when we talk about pollinators? And I know Amanda mentioned earlier, we're talking about insect pollinators, I believe for the census count, but for the purposes of my talk, when I say bees, again, I generally mean all pollinators, big and small. And that means uh, not only sort of the most readily identifiable pollinator, our honeybee, but also all the different pollinators that you see here on my screen. Uh, some of these might be unfamiliar to you, but I'm guessing you can quickly and easily identify the honeybee and probably that monarch butterfly as well. Uh, we have a number of other different types of pollinators here. Of course, there's a bumblebee, there are wasps, uh, beetles make poll are, are pollinators. And uh, the second most efficient pollinator aside from bees are actually flies. And uh, the hoverfly that is seen here right below the monarch is actually not a bee. Some people uh, do confuse those with bees. 
They are called bee mimics, but that's a hoverfly, and there is another fly here on the screen. So you don't see license plates out there that say save the flies, but when uh, we talk about saving pollinators, we mean not just bees, not just the pretty butterflies and moths, but we mean pollinators of all kinds, including our fly. So now that we're all on the same page, whoop, there's my hoverfly. Uh, I just want to remind everyone again, why do we care about pollinators? Specifically, we care about pollinators because they are incredibly important in our ecosystems. You guys have all joined because you already know how important pollinators are you know, to agriculture, but also to our landscapes. Of course, honeybees are not native to this area, but they are still important in agriculture. But they're not the end all be all of pollinators, right? We have a tremendous number of native pollinators, and in this case, I am only talking about bees, that are uh, also incredibly important, especially when honeybees are not available in the landscape or in some agricultural crops. We're special here in North Carolina that we have over 500 native bee species just in North Carolina, and the Southeast is home to even more. So it's truly a wonderful place to be, and uh, here is only just a small grouping of pollinators that I've uh, captured here in North Carolina. But remember, honeybees are great, butterflies are wonderful, but our native bees are also tremendously important. So you all, all are probably also aware if you uh, pay attention to media or talk with people or are educated at all about pollinators, many populations are in fact in decline, not just in the US, but worldwide. It is of concern and thank goodness we have so many wonderful people who are contributing science to studying the reasons for the decline and also how we can offset those declines. I have some of the reasons uh, very broadly grouped here. Diseases and pests, of course, are a concern. Climate change is a factor for pollinator decline. Uh, chemical use and misuse is. And then the last one I have here is loss and feeding and nesting habitats. The reason I have that in green is because I'm gonna talk about how we all, every single person on this webinar and anyone who views it can contribute to a positive influence on our pollinator populations by helping, helping individually to combat this particular last bullet point. And so that's why I have it in green is just to remind you each and every one of us can make a difference. So just, <laughs> I usually give an hour long lecture. So Amanda was very cruel to only give me 10 or 15 minutes. So right now I'm just saying that uh, I'm gonna try and go through this in as timely a fashion as possible. But if you're interested, yes, I see you, Amanda. If you're interested in hearing more, uh, just reach out to me. I love to speak with garden clubs, master gardener groups, anyone who wants to hear me talk. It's obvious that I can't stand talking to people. That's a joke, I love to talk. So. How do you give a 15 minute talk on your favorite plants? Well, the first and foremost thing that you need to know when you're talking about picking out plants for your garden or urban green space, when it comes to supporting pollinators is that we want to really lean into the seasonality. You guys were all listing some of your favorite pollinator plants that you see blooming now. That's amazing. I always encourage people to keep notes and list those things that are blooming so that next year, when you're planning your garden in March or in February, you can go back and look at that list and think, well, what was blooming and what times did I have a lack of things blooming in my garden? Where can I buy something to fill that niche? So seasonality is one of the most important things I can underscore when we're talking about planting anything with pollinators in mind. Why? Well, it's because the plants that we provide provide both carbohydrates and proteins and nutrients for the pollinators who are visiting our plants. Flowers provide either pollen or nectar, or in some cases, both. And it stands uh, right now for me to just remind everyone that not all plants are created equal. Some plants do produce better quality pollen, meaning they have more complete proteins or additional nutrients that other pollens don't have. Same is true with our nectars. And uh, I have been working with a team who does research on that, but 
Again, I only have 15 minutes. So we're only going to talk about plants in general terms, but just remember, not all plants are created equal, but the ones that I'm going to talk about today are ones that we know through research and through our own studies are good, in fact, for pollinators. Something else to consider when you're thinking about which plants to add to your garden or if you're building a garden from scratch is that each of our individual pollinators have their own unique needs or preferences when it comes to our uh, flowers that are providing nutrients, just like kids, right? And not all kids like the same foods. It's the same with pollinators. Some pollinators are lazy and they like those open faced flowers like the, the Gallardia here in the top right, primarily beetles. They don't like to work too hard for their plants, so they like those daisy type flowers. And so each of the different types of flowers you see here are going to provide a diversity of food options for the tremendous diversity of pollinators that you will bring to your garden. So my talk is about plants. It means that I have to tell you what my favorite pollinator plants are. But I always tell people, picking a favorite pollinator plant is like picking a favorite kid. How do you do that, right? Uh, since I only have one child, it's easy for me to say I have a favorite. And in this case, I have five favorites, but I'm going to continue with the last five minutes I have given in my talk to not just talk about these five, but to talk about a whole bunch more. If I were only to pick five native, perennial, sun-loving plants to bring pollinators to my garden, these are the five I would pick. You can see each of these um, photos. I took all of them, except I can't get, even though uh, the very first plant, the mountain mints, which I know some of you have in your garden, are a tremendous pollinator plant. For whatever reason, I picked a picture that didn't have a pollinator on it. But it's not uncommon at all to find multiple pollinators and multiple species of pollinators on any of these plants in any given day. So these are wonderful, again, native, perennial, sun-loving, and easy to grow. Someone else said milkweed earlier. I have Asclepias tuberosa here, the butterfly weed, that orange plant down in the lower left. Uh, that's a wonderful plant. However, any of the milkweeds are also equally wonderful. And I've been seeing a lot of common milkweed blooming just along the roadsides, and it reminds me that they're wonderful as well, although fewer people have them in their gardens. A lot of people ask me about shade loving plants. I have this slide to remind people that of course pollinators prefer sunny locations because it's warm, but obviously we don't all have full sun gardens and not all pollinators necessarily prefer that either. So it's really nice to add additional pollinator forage in your shadier areas. It does occur to me looking at this slide that the, the plants that I have mentioned here are tending to be very early sp spring bloomers. With the exception of that Monarda, I have Monarda growing uh, in a very shady spot that's in full bloom right now. Although most of these plants listed here, the hellebores, which are another one of my very favorite pollinator plants because they bloom so early, and the columbine and golden alexanders uh, also all tend to, to bloom early on. And then don't forget, of course, there are lots of great shrubs. I have two North Carolina natives listed here. I've been giving this talk or a version of it for the last five years. It and inevitably, someone will ask me in the Q&A, well, I've got deer or I have rabbits. What do I plant if I have those plant, if those pests? So here's just a quick list of some plants that uh, I recommend that are supposed to be deer and or rabbit resistance. I say that and I will tell you a very quick story that I gave the same talk at the Native Plant Society meeting last year in the mountains of North Carolina at Cullowee. And I stood up in front of 150 people and I said, uh, bee balm is great, deer don't like that. You know, Black Eyed Susan is great, deer don't like that, yada, yada, yada. Don't forget herbs, they're aromatic. They're not native to this area, but they're fantastic pollinator plants. And they tend to be fairly vertebrate pest resistant. After I gave that talk, I drove back to my house where every single head of my Black Eyed Susans had been eaten by deer. 
So I will tell you that story only simply to say that the deer don't listen to my talk and they have no idea that they're not supposed to like Black Eyed Susan. So in essence, I can only give you recommendations. And if your deer are smarter than me, then uh, they may eat your Black Eyed Susans. But again, for the most part, if you pick plants that have a strong scent or they have uh, trichomes, you know, those uh, little fuzzy things on their leaves, in general, the deer and rabbits should leave them alone. But again, you can't go wrong with planting those herbs either, especially if you have uh, pests that might uh, eat your other plants. We talked about seasonality. I'm not gonna go a lot into this, but it never hurts to sort of think about um, individual plants, you know, what works in the spring, what is blooming, what's blooming in the summer, what will bloom from summer into fall. And not every plant only fills a single niche. I'm using the false indigo, which mine right now looks uh, like the one on the far right here on the screen. It's just uh, leafy green foliage, but those beautiful, cool seed pods are out. And so I had color in the spring, foliage in the summer, and now I have those really awesome seed pods that uh, are not good for pollinators, but do create visual interest in the garden all year long. So that's just something else to consider when you're picking plants. I'm going to go through the last of my slides very quickly. And again, I know that this is being recorded, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time Y'all can go back and take notes on things uh, the second time through. Here are some wonderful native spring bloomers. I've already talked about some of these. Some of these are new for me to talk about. If we're talking about summertime and you're thinking about design, which might be something that you would like to add into your garden, uh, think about some of those cool colors, some of those really great pollinator plants, and then add additional pops of color with some of those other bright summer bloomers as you add color to that pollinator garden. And then some of the things are really important in late summer and early fall, because again, we wanna make sure that we're providing both pollen and nectar to our pollinator friends all season long while they're out there working very hard. Asters are one of my very, very favorites. Coneflower, I think you can't go wrong with because they bloom early in the summer and they bloom all into the fall. And then if you enjoy songbirds, I never deadhead my purple coneflower because after the bees are done enjoying them, then when the seed heads pop out, I often will get goldfinch on those coneflowers. So they're just, um, in my opinion, a wonderful choice. And I know some of you were mentioning Joe Pieweed earlier, another amazing butterfly plant, especially, but pollinators of all kinds love them. Just a few very quick other things to remember. Uh, oftentimes our hybrid flowers can be highly bred and this dahlia uh, is a gorgeous plant, of course, but because of the nature of its breeding, it has so many petals that the pollinators have a really hard time getting in to access any of the nectar or pollen. So just consider a straight species, again, if you're planting for pollinators. It goes without saying, but it's worth saying it. Avoid using pesticides if you can around your yard. And if you must use pesticides, try to do it very early in the morning or very late in the evening, as long as it's safe for you as an applicator so that the pesticides aren't coming in contact with those pollinators. And then lastly, uh, don't forget to include larval host plants in your landscape. Asclepias, the milkweed are fantastic. I put dill and fennel in my yard and in my garden, not because I use it. Uh, oftentimes the swallowtail caterpillars get to it well before I have a chance to put it in my potato salad. But uh, don't forget a lot of those plants, the passion flower, folks mentioned that earlier, are fantastic larval host plants as well. And then lastly, no matter what your garden looks like, no matter how much space you have, no matter how much variety or uh, how green your thumb is, each and every one of us has the chance to make a difference when it comes to pollinator planting and pollinator protection. So remember in aggregate, we can have a tremendous difference together. And then I have one last slide and I'm just gonna throw it up here. I'm working with Charlotte, maybe doesn't know this yet, uh, on a certified pollinator habitat certificate program for our community members in North Carolina. So if you're interested in that, email me and just let me know that you're interested 
And with that, I will stop talking. Thank you all so very, very much for your time. Thank you, Denisha. And you can totally sign me up for that. Let me know how I can help you with that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so Hannah, you are next. Okay. Excellent. Great. Excellent. All right. I think it's good. Let me know if it's not good, but I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm excited to chat with you all about once you're out in the field doing the pollinator census, some tips and tricks that you could use. And Denisha gave a great presentation that I'm going to refer back to because she had a lot of great points, starting with her disclaimer that I probably will also refer to bees mostly. That's what I work on. But I don't just mean bees. You can apply this to a lot of different pollinators and insects. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so first I will talk about why identification is important, and then I'll go into some sampling techniques that maybe you can consider using while you're doing the census. And then once you have an insect, some quick field ID tips and tricks, very broad because you're going to be out in the field looking at it, not under a microscope. Um, and then assuming I have time, which I should, I'll talk about some really brief uh, research topics related to this. So identification is important because there are so many different pollinators in North Carolina, but just in general, and they all can live very differently. Uh, they all need different resources. So without knowing that identity of that organism, there's a lot of information that you just wouldn't have access to. So once you identify it, you then have access to that information and you can really work towards learning how best to support that insect. So the main thing is knowing what resources they need to survive. So for the most part, all of these pollinators need nesting resources and foraging resources, but those resources can be very different. Some uh, bees live in different places than others. Some visit different flowers than others. So until you know what that species is, you don't know what those resources are that it needs. So by identifying, we can better serve these organisms, better work to conserve them. Another thing is they can act as indicators of environmental health. Some species are more sensitive to others or more sensitive to very specific environmental stressors. And once we know that and can identify that organism and we see changes in their population, that can then inform us about larger patterns going on in the landscape. We can also appreciate their importance, both economically as far as crop pollination goes, but also ecologically. They are providing pollination services to the majority of the flowering plants all over our landscape. So they're extremely important and the more we know about them, the more we can appreciate them. And then I think it's a really great way to connect to nature. Uh, once you start learning these different insects and you start interacting with them, I think you'll be surprised that you start to notice more of those details just in your everyday life. As you're walking down the sidewalk, you'll see things you didn't notice before. And I find that really rewarding. Um, so I think it's a great way just to have a better connection to the land you're on and the areas you're um, active in. Okay, so with that, we'll move quickly into some sampling techniques. So for the most part, I believe the census is expecting you to work with visual IDs. However, these are very small things and they can move very quickly. And uh, until you get to know them, it can be hard to know what you're even looking at. So I'm gonna talk about some sampling techniques where you can maybe capture them just to give yourself a longer time period to look at them and try to identify what you're looking at. So all of this is just to give you more time to get to know them. So the first technique that is very common um, is using a hand net. There's a lot of places online where you can buy these, sometimes for very cheap. Uh, one thing I wanna be careful about though is that you make sure you have a very fine mesh on the net. If you have a, a wider mesh, a lot of the small insects can escape right through the holes. So when you're looking for one, try to find the smallest mesh possible, but there are some pretty affordable options. And so if you've never used one before, um, here's a quick demonstration of a good way to use it. So right here, I'm capturing a bumblebee, but again, this can be uh, used for any sort of insect. 
But the main thing is if you see one, you want to try to get that net all the way to the ground as quickly as possible. Of course, if you're in a garden or a public garden, try to be careful about damaging the plant. But that way you're ensuring that you know the insect is in your net. You can be aware of where it is at all times. That keeps you and the insect safe. And it also prevents um, a lot of insects can escape out the bottom if you don't have it all the way to the ground. So most insects have a tendency to go up towards light. You'll use that to your advantage. And you can see as soon as I have the net around her, this bumblebee goes right up to the top. I then pinch off the net so that I know where she is at all times. The next part is getting it out of the net. If you wanna just look at it in the net and then release it, that's fine. But if you wanna get it out, right now I'm using a small tube and you can see that once I have that tube in the net, I flip it up. I'm using the tendency for these bees to go up towards light to my advantage again. And once I flip the tube up, she follows and starts going up and I can close the tube and take her out of the net. And then that gives me more time to look at her up close and personal. So here's a few examples of tubes. Um, these are also available online. These are not the specific tubes I'm necessarily recommending, more just examples, but feel free to be creative with this. You can also use the tubes themselves and just tube insects right off of plants. You see it crawls right up and then you can look at it in the tube. And when you're ready to release it, um, some people get a little nervous, but just go ahead, open up the tube, point it away from yourself, and that bee or that pollinator is going to want to keep doing what you interrupted it doing. It's not really going to focus on you. So put it near a flower, just open it up, and she should go right out. Another tool that's pretty common is aspirators. So basically, you use your breath to um, suck up insects into this collection tube. And I have a short clip on how to use that. So you'll do sharp breaths inward. Um, you can use the metal straw side, point it at the insect you're wanting to collect and just breathe really quickly right into the tube. One side has a filter on it, so you would not get the insect all the way up the part you're breathing through. It should get into the tube and then stop. But I do want to encourage you to just be creative. Use what you have in your house. If you have jars or old uh, sauce containers, um, Tupperware, you can be creative. So here I'm reusing an old honey jar and just collecting the bee right off the flower, just like I did with the tube, just like I did with the net. Um, with jars, I do like having jars that have a smaller opening than the rest of the jar. That just gives you more time to close the jar. If it's a large mouth, the insects could find their way out before you have a chance to take a look at them. So the smaller the opening, the, the quicker, um, you can get the jar closed and take a look um, is what I have found. But just be creative and um, use whatever you have around your house. You don't necessarily have to buy something for this. So let's say you use one of those techniques. You now have an insect and you want to know what you're looking at. Um, so I'm not going to go into very specific detail. Matt is going to have a lot of great information about this. But just generally when you're in the field, the main question I get is how to decide if you're looking at a fly, a wasp, or a bee. Those are the big three that I think people have the, the hardest time learning to distinguish between. So very generally, I'll talk about some things to look at. And there's a lot of different um, body parts that you can use to help you learn these different groups. So the first is the body shape. And these three here, I think, are a really great example of the differences you can look for. For flies, they have kind of rounded bodies. They all, all their different body parts kind of just blend together in this big round body. Where wasps are more angular, they're very streamlined. They're hunters, they're hunting other insects, so they need to be aerodynamic. So they're pretty sleek and streamlined, very angular. They also have what we call a wasp waist right here, where the front part of their body connects very narrowly to their abdomen, the back side of their body. And compare that to the fly, you can see just how different their body shape is. And then the bees are kind of in between. They're a little more rounded, but they still have some angles. And for the most part, the bees you're gonna be finding out there are gonna be the hairiest of the three. They're actively collecting pollen. You can also look at the antenna. So bees and wasps have these long elbowed antenna. Flies have short antenna. And this species that I'm showing here actually has fairly long antenna for flies. You could find some flies that look like they don't have any antenna at all. So that's a really good trick. You can also look at the eye size. Flies, their eyes take up almost the entirety of their head. 
where bees and wasps have uh, more narrow eyes. And then the big one I think that is easiest to learn is differences in the number of wings. So flies have two wings, one wing on each side of their body, where bees and wasps have four wings, two on each side of their body. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but on this wasp, there's a small wing right in the front here, and then a larger wing right behind that. So that repeats on each side for a total of four. So that has been something that a lot of people really pick up on once they know to look for it. Flies, two wings, bees and wasps, four wings. So then let's say you have an insect, you look at it and you decide you do have a bee. Um, there's different categories of bees that you're uh, hoped to identify for the census. So to give you a couple tricks for hoping, hopefully you can start to distinguish between those groups. There's like four main things that I tell people to look for when you are trying to identify a, a bee. And the main thing is putting them into uh, general groups. This isn't gonna necessarily get you down to species. But the first thing is looking at the different areas on their body where different bee species carry pollen. So the different examples I have here, first at the top, we have a bumblebee. She packs her pollen into very tight pollen balls on her hind legs. In North Carolina, the only kinds of bees that do this, that carry pollen this way are honeybees and bumblebees. So right away, if you see a bee and it has a very tightly packed pollen ball, you know you're either looking at a honeybee or a bumblebee. So you can knock out all the other types of bees. The most uh, common way to carry pollen for our species in North Carolina is like this bottom picture here where she's carrying all of her pollen all over her hind leg. She does not pack it into a ball. It's pretty messy. Sometimes it can cover their entire body, but most of the pollen they're carrying all over, all up and down those hind legs and they could be completely covered. And then the other group that's easy to look for is our leaf cutter bees and mason bees. They actually have these hairs on the underside of their belly. So they're carrying their pollen on their belly. And that's pretty different than these other groups. So once you know, you can notice where bees are carrying pollen, that can really help you narrow down what group you're looking at. So if you see a bee that's carrying pollen on its belly, but you might think it's colored and looks like a bumblebee, you now know it cannot be a bumblebee because it doesn't have pollen in pollen balls. So you can start to mix and match uh, things you know to help you narrow down. Another thing that people can use is coloring patterns. Sometimes this can be tricky. There are bees that look like each other that aren't, but there are a few that um, can be really helpful to learn more about their hair patterns. And the one that I get the most questions about is how to distinguish between a carpenter bee and a bumblebee. So this top picture is a carpenter bee. You can, in the bottom one is a bumblebee. You can see they're both black and yellow. They can look pretty similar, but the biggest difference is carpenter bees do not have hair on the backside of their abdomen. You can see it's reflecting light here. It's very sh shiny, it's hairless. And the bumblebee has black and yellow hair all the way all over its body. It's not reflective, it's not shiny. So that is a steadfast rule. That is the best way to distinguish between carpenter bees and bumblebees. But as you get more comfortable with these groups, you might notice other um, characteristics pop out to you like that. Another thing is size. Bees emerge as adults fully grown. So when you see a small bee, it's not because it's still growing, that is just a smaller species. So that can also help you um, pick out what group you're looking at because if it's an adult small bee, that knocks out um, carpenter bees, bumblebees. So you can start narrowing it down that way. And then the last thing is seasonality. So there are some bee species in North Carolina that are only active in the beginning of the year, some that are active at the end of the year and others that are active all throughout. Um, and since you're doing the census in August, you already have some groups of species that are only active in early spring that you know you are not gonna see when you're out in August. So you can also use that to help you narrow down what you're looking at. All right, so that was really quick. Uh, we only have a short time today, but if you want to know more or if you want to review some of the information I just talked about or in more detail, you can access this book online for free as a PDF. Um, Elsa Youngstead, another professor at NC State, and I wrote this together. So you can just search the Bees of North Carolina or you could copy that link that's right there. Um, you can purchase a hard copy version if you'd like, but this goes into much more detail and with diagrams pointing out what different body parts, what different characteristics to look for to help you learn how to distinguish between these different groups of bees. 
All right, and I think I have a few minutes left to talk about research. And I tried to pick um, projects that highlighted the importance of identifying different bees. And then once you have that information, what you can do with it. So that was kind of how I picked these different um, projects to summarize. So like Amanda said, I'm a community ecologist and I mainly work in agricultural systems to understand how we impact the environment and then how we can work to mitigate that. And the main tools that I use are looking at beneficial insects, mostly pollinators to understand this. And a lot of effort has been made to add habitat back into, you know, everywhere, but especially in agricultural areas. And so a lot of the work I've done has been looking at once this habitat is back in the environment, what happens to the organisms we're trying to support. So to quickly summarize, we'll look at this first one here, community dynamics. Um, so we had habitat that was added into agricultural areas across North Carolina. Um, and then we looked at the bee community over time to see how they responded to that. So we looked at the abundance or the number of individuals we collected across three different years, as well as the diversity or the number of species we found over time. And we found that adding habitat back into the environment increased the abundance and the diversity um, as long as it was high quality habitat. So that's really great, but also shows you how important it is to be able to identify what we're looking at so that we can track over time what these different populations are doing. Another thing that we've done is we looked at bee health. So, so bees can get sick just like us. Um, so we had focal species that we looked at and we screened them to see if they had different viruses or different pathogens and how the habitat was maybe influencing that. So again, we need to know what species we're looking at and then also identifying the pathogens we're looking at is very important. I've also done work looking at what species are pollinating different crops. So here um, I'm showing a bumblebee queen in soybean flowers. And then I've also done work in blackberries and knowing the identity, what insects are actually providing pollination services and how that results in increased yield is very important to report back to growers so they that then know what species are there on their farms and what are helping them with their pollination. A few more examples, so we can look at um, nesting resources so we've talked a lot about the foraging resources but having a place to actually build nests and lay their eggs is also extremely important and without nests we won't have the next generation of pollinators so nesting resources are extremely important i'm doing work currently looking at what species are nesting within crop fields but i've also partnered with um, the horticulture group that's putting on this event as well as master gardener volunteers across North Carolina to look at what nests are being built and from what species in gardens around North Carolina in different counties. Um, and then that way, once we know that information, we can provide more detailed um, recommendations for garden management, for crop management, so that we're not destroying nests accidentally. There are other ways we can also measure bee health. So this example here, I worked with an undergrad, Nia Brown from UNC Pembroke, and we were looking at different bee species in pollinator habitat and seeing if they had mites. And if they did have mites, um, Matt was helping us actually identify what species they were. So that can help us um, improve our recommendations for how to establish pollinator habitat so that we are making sure we're providing the best resources for bees. And the last example I have is another project that I'm working on with Ren Rooney, an undergrad at NC State, and David Tarpey, another professor at NC State. And we're collecting bees from pollinator plots, looking at different bee species, collecting the pollen off of those species to see what bee species are visiting what plant species. And that can also help us improve recommendations for what to put in these pollinator habitats. What species are, are pollinators, excuse me, actually visiting and actually collecting resources from. Because like Denisha said, not all of plant species provide the best pollen, not all provide the best nectar. So it's good to know what species are providing what for our pollinators. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you for the invitation and I am very happy to share with all of you today. Here's my email if you have questions, but also hopefully I have time to answer some questions today. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. And we've had a, few, a couple of questions already thrown into the question and answer section. And if you guys want to take a look at those, 
Um, and it's Matt's turn and Matt threw down a challenge. He said, be prepared. I'm about to blow some minds and challenge some generalizations. So stand back guys. And Matt, you well, know? yes, yep. I, I will say uh, identification of insects and other arthropods is difficult, uh, even for me sometimes. So that's, uh, if it wasn't, I wouldn't have a job. So thank you for being difficult uh, uh, sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, so can everybody hear me? See everything all right? Okay, so uh, Hannah introduced bees uh, a bit, and I'm going to basically talk about kind of identification and kind of looking at these things, uh, uh, how to identify them on the flowers. But of course, because this is going to be a fairly quick talk, there's no way to basically tell you how to identify all the things that can be on flowers. So I'm going to try and give you some very broad strokes. Uh, if you have uh, photos, sometimes it's easier to zoom in on these things, but while you're counting them uh, live, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult. So without further ado, um, so uh, here are some bees. Uh, so everybody likes to talk about bees as pollinators. And yeah, I like bees enough, but, uh, you know, they get a lot of attention and uh, and Hannah will appreciate this. But uh, she mentioned some of the bees out there. And I don't know if you anybody recognizes any of these bees. Uh, I would say out of these, my favorite is this top middle one. Uh, I don't know if Hannah agrees to that, but uh, these are uh, carpenter bees, the little carpenter bees, which are actually in the, uh, very closely related, although tiny. Uh, and the students here often actually misidentify them for sweat bees, which is also funny. Um, and uh, and see sweat bees, bumblebees, and honeybees. So uh, bees are basically hairy wasps, hairy hunting wasps. Bees evolved from mud dauber type wasps, hunting wasps, which is really interesting. They're just vegetarian cousins of them, which also presents a difficulty because they are very similar looking in a lot of ways to, to other wasps. Um, and the way you identify bees technically is by the hairs, the branched hairs, which looking 10 feet away is not going to tell you anything. So and I will tell you also that there are a lot of things that mimic bees because bees and wasps sting, can sting in defense. And so these uh, non-stinging insects can actually mimic them to gain defense, basically. So moving into wasps. So wasp is just a general term for any kind of hymenopteran, larger hymen, hymenoptera that's oftentimes a stinging one. But there are also these lots of these other ones, lots of parasitoid ones that are tiny, uh, lots of other parasitic ones that are a bit bigger. Um, and it's really difficult to generalize how you would say a wasp versus a bee. And then I'll try and tell you how to tell flies from wasps. Uh, but here's a kind of smattering of some wasps uh, that might you might find out there. And a couple of things to note about wasps that you wouldn't find in bees, for instance. So for one thing, uh, as Hannah said, that many wasps have really thin wasp waist, uh, although I'm going to uh, put a link right now on a fly, a bee fly, which I have yet to see, which I would love to, it's not uncommon, uh, to show you how uh, these things might not fit all the time. But uh, we'll get to flies in a, in a few minutes. But basically, uh, if you see a very thin waist, it's not going to be a bee. Uh, but you may have a fly or some other insect that has a really thin waist. If it has a long ovipositor, this kind of stinger-like thing, uh, it is definitely not going to be a bee. Those are mostly in parasitoid wasps. Uh, but not all wasps have that long ovipositor, or they're developed into a stinger that's held inside the body. Uh, some wasps are hairy, but these hairs aren't going to have branches. So uh, this is a yellow jacket, a uh, very fuzzy yellow jacket from the mountains. Uh, I will say that for yellow jackets and paper wasps, these social um, uh, vespid wasps, and some of the mud, do um, the potter wasps, the mud uh, uh, clay pot making vespids, they actually have a notch in their eye and they also fold their wings longitudinally. So they fold their wings lengthwise and bees will never do that or have the notched eye. So those two things can help you when you're when you're um, identifying these things. Also, uh, other than, uh, and, and Hannah can correct me, other than bumblebees, most true bees don't have uh, dark wings, at least very dark wings. So if it's not a bumblebee and it's got fairly dark wings, it's probably gonna be some kind of other wasp. And again, like Hannah stated, wasps, unlike flies, have four wings. So if you could see all four wings, here's the two wings on the side of the scoliad wasp. 
um, uh, you, that's helpful, but oftentimes it's tough to tell on wasps and bees. So uh, those other characteristics she mentioned, like the longer antennae are a very good one. If it has very long antennae, it's probably not going to be a fly. Of course, I say probably because there's so many exceptions. So um, moving on. Um, now ants will be there too. So ants are just wingless wasps as well. So they've they've evolved to be kind of these social wingless wasps that live underground. So when you get bit by a fire ant, that's actually the fire ant stinging you because it's a wasp. Uh, but ants will visit plants as well. So if you, uh, I don't have to really probably tell anybody how to ID ants, so I'm not going to stay on this. But you will see them on flowers. Now the problem is that some bees are tricky. So this one even tricked me. I thought it was a small hunting wasp, but then I kept looking at it back and forth and back and forth. And I was like, huh. So it does, and Hannah can correct me, but this is a masked bee, a colletid, a hylias, which are very small black bees. They don't have much hair on them. So we were discussing this a little bit and how do you actually figure out whether it's a bee or not, if, especially if you're looking far, from far away? Well, you might just unfortunately have to miss ID it. But the other alternative, if you can see, is that uh, the on the hind foot, the tarsus of, of bees, the first segment of these five is much wider than the rest. But that means you've got to be able to see that. So good luck. Uh, but otherwise, you know, these little tiny bees, some of these little bees, and just because it's metallic does not mean it's uh, a bee because a sweat bee, for instance, because cuckoo wasps and many small wasps are also metallic. Uh, so bees technically are wasps, so that's another part of the problem. So hopefully I'm giving you more solutions than problems, but just know that the ID is difficult. Okay, so moving on to flies. So flies are my favorite group of insects, uh, and they are hugely important pollinators. In fact, if you like chocolate, chocolate is only pollinated by flies. If you like certain other things, like apparently Venus flytraps are pollinated by sometimes by flies, but also by some bees and, and beetles and things like that. So um, it's a it's a really amazing diverse group of insects, and uh, there's actually been some really new papers on flies and pollination. And one of the really the really impressive things about flies is that they not only provide pollination services, but they provide a lot of other services. So bees are great, but all they do is eat pollen and pollinate flowers and suck on nectar and eat pollen for their larvae and things like that. Flies, on the other hand, their larvae, the maggots, many times are decomposers. They feed on in your compost. They're the ones doing the heavy lifting to decompose all that stuff in your compost. They're helping free nutrients out there. And some of them are parasites or predators of pests, like plant pests. Uh, and then they turn out to be adults that will go to flowers and start pollinating as well. So they are, give double effects on their, on their basically their importance. So I'm just going to tout flies because they're amazing. Uh, and they're also the, most people think they're ugly or or whatever or weird, and they just need a lot more PR than bees, uh, unfortunately. So here's some things to look at for flies. So flies, by definition, never have more than two wings. There's no fly out there that has more, more than two wings. And in fact, it does technically have hind wings, but over through millions of years of evolution, they, all flies have the, their hind wings reduced to these small uh, club-like organs called haltiers. They look like little drumsticks and they actually vibrate uh, in air to balance them while they fly, which also makes them some of the best flyers out there. Uh, typically their antennae are short, but there are exceptions. They all have soft mouth parts, so none of them chew on plants or chew on things, but they can access pollen and nectar through these soft sponging mouth parts. Um, and, you know, a lot of them look like a typical fly, you would think, but they're not all like that. Another thing you might look at is the wing venation, if you can see it. So typically bees and wasps are going to have a lot of these blocky cells in the wing veins, uh, in the wings, wing membrane, uh, uh, bordered by these veins. Uh, and then of course, they're going to have the two wings, whereas flies have typically these longer kind of swooping veins that don't really make these blocks and cells. Uh, they do make cells, but they're not typically blocky or rounded. Okay, here's an example of some flies on uh, flowers. So these are bee flies. Now, like I said, they have, there's a dual duty kind of thing. So bee flies are great for pollinating and they're really beautiful little flies, uh, but their larvae actually parasitize bees. So they can kill bees, uh, but that might be good. There's a bee flies that attack carpenter bees and kill them. So if you hate carpenter bees, then sure, you might be happy for the flies. 
Uh, even these, this is a, uh, used to be considered a blowfly, but now they're pollenian flies. And uh, they've got these little golden crinkly hairs on them. And these actually parasitize earthworms, which is really interesting. Um, these uh, soldier flies live in kind of muck and many of them will feed in the compost bins that you have out there. Uh, but these actually look a little bit more wasp-like. They have the smaller eyes, the longer antennae, but again, only two wings and this special wing venation uh, you know, can help you uh, uh, identify them. And there's a lot of these other little flies. Uh, you know, this one has the typical short, eye, uh, short antennae, uh, lapping mouth parts, things like that. Um, and finally, you might have some true fruit flies. Uh, these I found in my Coreopsis in my front yard, and they are covered in pollen. They're mating. They're all very interested in the flowers. And yes, they may be pollinating. But another thing about them is that these flies. Uh, those little kind of circles in the disc are actually their maggots. So they lay their eggs in the heads of flowers and feed on those flowers. Mosquitoes pollinate. So just because you hate mosquitoes doesn't mean they're not important pollinators. So here's a biting one, a serophora, and here's a non-biting elephant mosquito. In fact, elephant mosquitoes are not just beneficial for being pollinators, but they are predators as larvae of other mosquito larvae. They're also our largest uh, mosquito species. And because they feed on larvae as young, they don't need protein to feed on blood. And so they don't even feed on people. So they are the good guys. Uh, this is a male with these very brush-like antennae, whereas the females have these uh, thinner antennae. And elephant mosquitoes, if you see a very large iridescent mosquito on a flower with this bent proboscis, leave it alone. Those things are good. They're very beneficial. And you can probably leave these alone too, although these are pretty vicious biters sometimes. So be aware of that. And it's not just the fly like flies. Uh, one of my favorite stories is this long tongued, fairly rarely encountered fungus gnat. Uh, I published on it pollinating and, and uh, visiting uh, viburnum flowers in my yard. Uh, very rare to observe this fly feeding. These are ones feeding on goldenrod up in the Smokies. And uh, these, uh, what you can see here, this is this bird-like insect. This is a little, this is a really weird fungus gnat. We don't even know what the larvae do. The whole entire group, nobody's ever discovered a larva of this group. Uh, but they do have pollen on them, which means they are potential pollinators. So flies are really important pollinators. And like I said, they do dual duty. So many of them are predators or parasites or decomposers, composters as young. And so then they come pollinate flowers and do those things. So they provide lots of different benefits to the environment. Uh, one of the most common families you guys see of flies on flowers are the hoverflies or flower flies, uh, the serpidae. Uh, and again, many of them are almost exactly the coloration of a typical bee. Uh, but again, two wings only, two wings. You can see the halteers here, only two wings, two wings. Luckily, some of them spread them out like that, so you can actually see them. Uh, some of them have this funky nose, and some of them have funky eyes. Uh, but again, this one has fairly long antennae, so don't just go by antennae. Uh, you know, those that that lapping mouth parts, don't mistake that for the bee's tongue. Uh, but you know, make it, maybe get recognize uh, some of the uh, hoverflies out there because uh, they are very commonly found on flowers um, and are very interesting in that many of them, like uh, this Toxamirus, the larvae are actually crawling around on your plants, feeding on aphids, they're aphid specialists. So they are not only good for pollination, but they're gonna be feeding on pests that you don't want. All right, now everybody's favorite butterflies and moths. Uh, yeah, they're great, uh, they're beautiful. Um, and uh, these are in the order Lepidoptera. And so you uh, can identify them fairly easy. I think most people know a lot of these, although some of the clear wing moths can be uh, mimics of wasps. Uh, but uh, they are characterized by having wings covered in scales, which are technically just modified hairs. Uh, and they have siphoning mouth parts that they curl up in a, in a, a coil. So they usually hold the siphon under their head. And when they stretch it out, it's actually uh, only a tube. They don't inject anything. They they basically just can only suck liquids. But those liquids can be anything from uh, puddling, where they go and suck water from puddles uh, near rivers for minerals and for water. Uh, they even people urinate places, and they'll actually go to that preferentially because there's minerals and all that stuff for these butterflies to feed on and moths. Um, but they can only drink liquids as adults. So they are very commonly found in flowers because of the the nectar that's provided. Now, moths and butterflies are all in the same group, Lepidoptera, and technically butterflies are just a group of day flying moths. They kind of evolved from moths, and there are many beautiful moths, there are many 
drab butterflies. Uh, but the one thing that you can tell butterflies from moths are apart are that all butterflies have at least clubbed antennae. So the tip of the antennae antenna is expanded, whereas moths will have uh, kind of tapered antennae that come to a point or uh, feathery antennae or branched antennae. Um, and so here we have a smattering of some Lepidoptera. I love this one right here. So I'll just reveal those. So we've got a plume moth that have these really cool uh, wings that they hold like this. Can't even imagine how they fly, but they're really just folded up kind of. Uh, you've got the zygenid moth here, uh, a pyr pyrasta moth here. Just you can see the proboscis feeding on the nectar. And of course, these are different butterflies, uh, a sulfur white butterfly, a hair streak, and an infallid. One of the most common groups of butterflies and very recognizable groups of butterflies that you're going to find on flowers are going to be the skipper butterflies. And the long tail skipper is one of my favorite butterflies ever, if not my favorite. Uh, it's got these beautiful blue iridescent scales uh, and they're fairly large. Uh, butter, uh, fairly, uh, most of these are mid-sized butterflies. They're smaller than the big swallowtails and they're bigger than some of the tiny ones. Uh, but they have this blocky head with these widely separated eyes. And the most distinct characteristic is that the club of their antenna is curved and pointed. So they have these basically almost look like a little mitten kind of holding, you know, curved a little bit. So look for these. These are going to be really common on flowers. OK, the final large order of insects to visit flowers are beetles. So this is the order, order coleoptera. In fact, many plants are only pollinated by beetles. These plants like magnolias, they evolved so long ago, there were no bees present in the world. There were no butterflies. It was all beetles and things like that, or moths that didn't really pollinate them. So if you look in your magnolias, especially southern magnolia, they're going to be beetle pollinated. Uh, and many things actually, and uh, things like uh, water lilies, for instance, are beetle pollinated because they're very ancient plants. So beetles are recognized by their uh, hardened forewings. So the, the forewings right here are actually, those are actually the uh, forewings that have evolved over time to be hardened or leathery. And they, they hold the uh, membranous uh, hind wings underneath them. And you can see in this wedge-shaped beetle, the wings are actually sticking out. Uh, many beetles actually have short uh, elytra, is what those uh, wing coverings are called. But uh, And some beetles don't have elytra or wings, uh, but uh, most of the ones you're going to see on flowers will have these recognizable kind of crunchy look. And uh, here's a smattering of some beetles that you might find. So this flower scarab is its head buried in some, some flowers uh, for obvious reasons. It's, you know, it's called that, so it's got to do that, I guess. Uh, you can see all the pollen in the face of this blister beetle. There's, there's several types of blister beetles and false blister beetles, which are not uh, that are somewhat close related, but not the same. You'll find sap beetles, uh, soldier beetles, which often have this very distinct orange and black look. Uh, lots of little tiny shining beetles in there that could be different families. And one of the most common groups of beetles you'll see of flowers are these tumbling flower beetles. They, they have this huge humpback with this pointed tip of the abdomen. Uh, and if you ever want to know why they're called that, just go near one and you'll find out because they're very nervous. And as soon as you go close, they're going to tuck their legs in and tumble off the flower. Uh, so count them quickly. Um, now, of course, there are also lots of other insects out there that are feeding on flowers. So uh, even earwigs feed on flowers uh, and or, or can be pollinated. You see all this pollen all over its face. It's feeding on that protein-rich pollen. Uh, bugs, true bugs, are very common on flowers. Uh, true bugs are a group of insects called the hemiptera, and they have these uh, straw-like mouth parts. So some are predators, like these assassin bugs, but you can see they're covered in pollen here because they're waiting on flowers to be to prey on things. But these plant bugs, which often feed on the actual plant sap, will opportunistically go to flowers to feed on the nectar and the sap in the flowers, and they'll get pollen on them and be pollinators as well. And then although this looks like a beetle, this is an ebony bug. You can tell bugs from beetles because they have five or fewer antennal segments, uh, whereas beetles are going to have uh, nine or more segments in their antennae. Um, these also have uh, sucking mouth parts, but in this picture, again, you can't even see it. And finally, not everything, you know, everything that's a flower has the potential to pollinate, I guess, but not everything at the flower is friendly to pollinators. So these are all different things you can find at flowers. And does anybody, can anybody ID what any of them are or what order they are in? So what about this one? Anybody know what this one is in? 
This one right here. Okay. What do you think, Amanda? It's a fly. It is a fly. So you can see the little halt ears here and the two wings. Okay. What about this one right here? Oh, no. Now I feel uh -huh. like a spot. Oh, that's, no. That's a hard one. Even Ooh, a lot of entomologists might not know. I'm going to go one. with the beetle because I love the lamellate uh, antennae, which beetles commonly have. Yeah, that's great. That's a very educated guess. And that's right. The, the beetles yes. typically <laughs> have, they have these very, beetles have very diverse antennal forms. And that's actually how you ID many of them. But it also does have these elytra here, these shortened, these hardened wing covers, but they're very short. So it does look kind of like a fly. Of course, we have a spider here. So lots of spiders like to sit on flowers, especially crab spiders and wait for prey, as do many predatory bugs like this ambush bug, literally in its name. It, it just sits there and these can be yellow or white or different colors depending on the flowers they're on. And they will actually sit there and prey on things. So just to show you what these are, uh, this is a, a thick headed fly. These wait on flowers because they also call them canoper flies or bee or what do they call them, bee gropers or bee grabbers. And what they do is they actually grab bees and with their abdomen, like a can opener, they pry, they grab them, they pry open their abdomen and lay an egg inside and then let the bee go. And then their larva develops inside the bee and kills it. Uh, these wedge-shaped beetles go even further. This one, you can see it's ovipositing inside the developing flower. And what mean, that means is those, egg, those eggs will hatch and it's tiny little larvae, which have legs, will grab onto a bee when it visits the flower, maybe many of those larvae will grab onto a bee. When the bee goes back to the nest, they drop off, go find the bee larvae and their pollen stores, and they basically eat everything and then turn into a grub and suck the bee larva dry and kill it. Uh, of course, the crab spiders and ambush bugs are direct predators. And you can see here a nymph of an ambush bug is jabbing its proboscis in the neck of a sweat bee. And this crab spider, I didn't even know was there. I just saw the bee hanging out. I thought it was uh, just relaxing, but no, it's uh, it's dead. Uh, so, you know, not every, you know, these can be pollinators, but they're also going to be feeding on uh, pollinators as well. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying uh, a quick thing about uh, uh, the plant disease and insect clinic. Amanda asked me to mention it. So we are a service-based lab here at NC State that can help people identify uh, plant diseases, insect pests, both home and plant. Tests. We accept free image samples and also accept physical samples for a small fee, but also encourage people to go out to see Amanda and other uh, people out at the extension offices if they have those questions. And Amanda knows how to submit samples to us and all the agents basically know, uh, use our services. And, and uh, we're happy to help you identify your things and tell you what you need to do about it, if anything. Uh, but uh, Overall, that's uh, we we basically get samples from all over the state and even sometimes out of state, and uh, we help people diagnose their plant or even household pest issues, things like that. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, thanks for having me, Matt. Thank you so much for your time, and Hannah, thank you for your time as well. And Denisha had to step out um, with some personal things, but um, thank you all. I. I now I feel like I, it's hard to follow that because I'm just going to talk about the census. Um, but so thank you guys so much for your time. Um, and the reason that I've really uh, gotten into doing a lot of pollinator programming is twofold. Um, I started as an extension agent um, in Lee County um, a, a little over a year ago, and we have the pollinator haven garden here. And um, and I was just really excited to get some programming started around the garden. And I attended a, a webinar in, um, or a, a conference back in October of last year. And I met Becky um, Griffin, who is an extension specialist at the University of Georgia Extension. And she created this program called the Great Southeast Pollinator Census um, as a way to um, get folks aware and inspired about pollinators in, um, in their garden, she realized that people were not, um, they weren't really aware that pollinators were important to their community gardens and to school gardens. And a lot of folks just never really realized that there were insects there and only associated insects with their negative experiences with insects. And so she started it in 2017 um, as a pilot with 50 gardens. And by 2019, she had launched it as a statewide program. 
uh, and they have been just growing steadily, even despite COVID. Um, they had um, people participating in it, in it. And last year, South Carolina joined um, as part of the census. And then, um, and this year is the first time that North Carolinians can um, participate in the Great Southeast Pollinator Census. So the goals of the census, like I said before, is threefold. Um, to create sustainable pollinator habit by educating gardeners such as yourselves about using plants that provide nutrition for our pollinators while handling our summer droughts and do not have disease or pest insect pressure. And I like to um, prefer, you know, kind of annotate the use of gardener. I take a very broad <laughs> definition of gardener. Anybody who is managing an outdoor space, whether it is a, you know, a backyard garden or even somebody who has property and is managing acreage and food plots for animals, all of that can be ha habit, pollinator habitat. And it kind of, by extension, kind of makes you a gardener because you're cultivating these spaces for a purpose. Um, so the second goal of the census is to increase the entomological literacy of our citizens. And um, Denisha and Hannah and Matt, like, your presentations are an excellent primer for what you can learn about insects. Um, Matt used a lot of technical terms. He or used a lot of order names. And I know that some of some folks are probably like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what a coleopteran is now. But you've at least heard the word. And if you continue to participate in the census and, and try to educate yourself about more about insects, those words will become familiar, just as familiar as those scientific names of plants. Um, thirdly, it's to generate useful data about our pollinator populations so we can begin to spot trends and see how pollinator populations are affected by weather and how honeybees influence native bee populations. Um, I noticed a, a couple folks have um, you know, anecdotally noting that they feel like they see less insects. Um, and some, I know a couple of folks commented that they've seen less um, uh, caterpillars this year than they have historically. And on one hand, you know, sometimes you can chalk it up to the weather and sometimes it's just not happening in your yard. But by culminating and, and taking data, we can actually start noticing trends through time. And you can't really say like, oh my gosh, this year, like all the pollinators are dead. If you didn't for the last five years or 10 years or 50 years, take data to really say like, no, it looks, this might be a fluke or no, something else is going on. So the data that you will take as part of your census participation goes into a big pile of data that will tell the story of a snapshot in time of the insect populations in North Carolina. So who can do the census? Um, anyone, anyone in North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina. I know a couple of folks on this webinar are not from North Carolina, Georgia, or South Carolina, and I heard a rumor that the census might be coming to some other places across the Southeast because it is the great Southeast pollinator census. But for this, for 2023, it's only North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina. And it can be anyone, children, students, citizens, businesses, patrons, government employees, anybody who is going to get that data sheet and watch a plant for 15 minutes. Um, and you can do it as many times as you want to. Where do you do the census? anywhere where there is a plant that has pollinators landing on it. So backyard, park, botanical garden, nature trail, planter to city center. Um, Becky uh, Griffin was telling me that there are some breweries in Georgia that, you know, out in their patio area, they've got all these beautiful plants and people are drinking beer with a census sheet and watching the plants sitting next to them while they're enjoying their beverage. Um, so anywhere where there's a plant with pollinators landing on it, and you don't have to do it in a large group or an event. Um, I'm, I've been amazed and blown away with the response across the state from different folks who are doing an event in their neighborhood or with their communities. There are master gardeners who are hosting events, site events. We're doing some in Lee County on both of the days um, of the census which is the 18th and 19th of August. And I do have a slide about that to remind you. But if you just want to download the data sheet from the website, which I'll also post up, you can just do it over your morning coffee. 
And what do I mean by doing the census? So it is a very, very simple protocol, uh, list of directions. Uh, first, you identify your plant that has insects landing on it. You get your official data, seat, data sheet, pencil, maybe a drink, maybe a seat. Um, it's August 18th and 19th, which is next Friday and Saturday. Who knows? It could be pouring down rain. It could be blistering hot. It could be 75 degrees and balmy. Who knows? You gotta love North Carolina. Um, so once you have your plant identified and your data sheet in your hand, you're gonna set a timer for 15 minutes and make sure it's 15 minutes. I know it, that is gonna take a long time. It may seem like a long time. Although if it's a lot of insects, you might notice that it goes a lot faster than you think. Um, but you're gonna put a tally mark next to each type of insect that you see each time it lands on the plant, even if you think it's the same insect. So let me repeat that. Every time an insect lands on a plant, even if you've been watching the same bumblebee, that you think is the same bumblebee land on the plant multiple times, you're going to can't count the landings. Um, and the reason for that is uh, Becky described in our June webinar that uh, statistically speaking, people are actually not good at discerning new, ver new insects versus the same insect that they think has been present. Um, and so statistically speaking, this actually evens the playing field for making sure that that data, it counts the way that we want it to count. So after that 15 minutes is up there, you put your data, um, you enter your data through an online uh, website. There's a QR code at the top of the data sheet, which is right here. Now, if you see at the top, uh, top right hand, there's a link to the, um, the web page, as well as a QR code. So if you've got your phone, you can just click a picture of that QR code and it'll open right up on your phone. The website will not have the data sheet. You can't put in your data on the website until I think I think Becky said like 6 a.m. on August 18th. So don't try to put it in early. We're trying to count only August 18th and 19th. Um, and what you're looking for, um, are carpenter bees, bumblebees, honeybees, small bees, wasps, flies, butterflies and moths, and other insects. And Hannah and Matt did an excellent job really defining some of the more technical elements of our bees and our wasps. Um, really the way that um, Becky has broken it down so you don't have to remember a sweat bee versus a mason bee versus um, any other bee. Any bee that's smaller than a honeybee can be counted as a small bee. Um, so your wasps, uh, your, your sweat bees and your mason bees will probably fit into a small bee. Um, I love that she also has reminded us that carpenter bees have shiny hineys. So that will help you tell the difference between bumblebees and carpenter bees. Now, as Matt said, and as Hannah said, we are not expecting anyone to be an entomology expert by the end of this webinar or by the end of even participating in the census. If this is the first time you're learning about insects and all these words seem really overwhelming to you, don't worry about it. Do the best you can. These, the census is there mainly as a way to experience and contribute to science. And only by doing the census or even just observing insects are you going to become familiar with, with them. Um, and so even if this is, might be the first or second time you've ever really watched insects before, this is your data is still useful. So don't get hung up if you've confused a honeybee with a small bee, or you think that you might have accidentally counted a carpenter bee as a bumblebee. Do the best you can. It will all turn out in the wash. There are two different versions of the data sheet. Um, there's one in English and one in Spanish. So if you work with Spanish speaking communities, they can participate as well. Um, and, and like I said, and as you can see, there are um, ID identification photos to help you remember um, what you're looking for as well. There's also an identification guide that Becky has put together on the website. Um, and again, it's also in Spanish. So for those of y'all who are interested in doing events or just doing it in their, your backyard and you want a quick reference sheet or something to quickly study what you're looking at, this is a great um, guide for you to, to have. 
Um, there's also an, a, a census pamphlet. So it's the same thing as the identification guide, um, except it's a little more, it's, it's easier to print out, especially if you're doing um, larger events for folks and you might need a lot of copies of something. This is something that you can print out on the back and front and back of the eight and a half by 11. And uh, just another shout out, there are a lot of materials that are available in Spanish, including curricula that have been developed around the census. So for those of y'all who have children in um, public school systems or private school systems or um, homeschool groups uh, on the website, which is right here, um, gsepc.org, it is all, all already on there. Um, so you can go there and check out um, all the cool resources that she has. One of the things that I, I saw somebody threw in the question and answer section, and I'm, I'm sorry right now, I can't see the question and answer section because of the way my screen is. Um, if you have a really active plant, like you've, like you've identified a plant that's got all like a huge patch and it's covered in insects and it's really hard to count them all, um, just watch a small section of it. Something about the size of a a basketball or um, a cross stitching hoop, you know, pick something that's reasonable for you. Just remember that that is the part that you're watching. Um, the goal is to really make sure you're just watching the same thing. So the data that you're gathering is in the same spot, um, which this means that, for example, this is um, one of our master gardeners and her husband. Um, Pigman, Pignanthema muticum, mountain mint, all the mountain mints are very popular with, um, with a lot of types of insects and they're fun to watch. Um, but it, it opens up an opportunity for the same kind of cluster of plants to be watched by multiple people. So maybe one person might watch one side of the plant and the other person might watch the other side. You just don't want to be watching the same section at the same time. Um, for those of y'all, again, who are hosting public events, um, there is a, a sticker that you can get printed, um, and uh, that's what's uh, here on the left-hand side, and you can email me um, if you want a copy of that. Uh, she, um, Becky has also made up these really cool pollinator census um, certificates, which can be, which are available to folks who are doing events. This is especially popular with kids who are doing it as part of their school. Um, she's got some really cute pictures of um, elementary school classes with all of them with their cute little certificates. Um, so here's a, a this is a this is the web page for the Great Southeast Pollinator Census. Again, it is next Friday and Saturday, August 18th and 19th. Um, and uh, if you go to gsepc.org, uh, this is what you'll see. All of the resources are on the top right hand corner of the, the web page. Um, she's got a portal for educators. So folks who have classrooms um, or are working with children, there are activities that you can do um, around the census. Um, and folks have said, well, if the census is only on the 18th and 19th, how can I use these resources? My, my school's not in class yet. Um, so you can still do the census, the, the protocol, the, the guide, the step-by-step -step instructions for doing the census are still a great protocol to use, even if you aren't necessarily gathering the data to contribute to the census. You can even keep a little census in your own classroom using that data sheet. Um, so you can think outside the box and, and then you can use these resources that she's developed. Um, Becky also has a newsletter, which I highly recommend signing up for. Um, signing up for, she sends them out about once a month, and usually has a little update about the census and may and a little highlight about a cool plant or a cool insect. Um, the, her Facebook page, the um, Great Southeast Pollinator Census Facebook page, is pretty active. If you like to see beautiful pictures of gardens and insects and pollinators, this is the place to go hang out. Um, and there are some really astute um, entomologists who are also members of the group. And so you can uh, get some uh, insect identifications as well as seeing some pretty pollinator plants. Same with the Instagram. Um, Becky's been um, getting into the Instagram. So if this is how you receive your information, they have an Instagram page. She also has a couple of YouTube videos. Um, so 
if you have been inspired to participate in the census, remember this is the first year it's ever in North Carolina. And I loved when we were planning this series and these activities, Charlotte Glenn had this great quote, we can't not do well, we are setting a baseline. So even if everyone in this, this webinar, all 170 something of y'all and everybody who watches the recording, if y'all just do it in your backyard, and over your morning cup of coffee or your morning cup of tea, that will be more than has ever been done in North Carolina. And every we and have when we have folks from the mountains to the sea, and that would be more coverage of North Carolina than happened in um, South Carolina and Georgia in the first year. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so with hope with that, let me see real quick. Um, I do see we're at 241 and um, I uh, wanted to share a little bit about what um, what we're doing in Lee County for those of y'all who need some inspiration and, um, and then we'll share some questions um, and answers. Um, so keep adding those questions to the, the Q&A section. Um, so in Lee County, we are uh, we are using the Pollinator Haven Garden, which is the demonstration garden at the uh, Extension Office here in Lee County. And for those of y'all who don't know where Lee County is, um, it is southwest of Raleigh. Um, uh, and if you're familiar with, uh, there's a famous nursery in this county um, that a lot of people come to and don't realize they're in, they're in uh, Sanford. Um, but on Friday, we are doing morning and afternoon sessions where folks can come and there will be master gardeners available to show people how to um, how to do the census using the protocol and how to identify the insects and then just be on hand to help with folks with data entry and any kind of outreach or education that folks have. Um, in regards to maybe the plants or the insects that they see in the garden. And then on Friday the 19th, or on, on Saturday the 18th, 19th, oh my goodness, on Saturday the 19th, our master gardeners will also be at our, the Sanford Farmer's Market, which is our county farmer's market. And we will have pollinator plants there at the market that will hopefully have pollinators coming to visit them. And folks could do the census while they're standing there in the farmer's market, or they can take the data sheets home and do the data sheets in their own gardens. Um, we'll also have a session, an afternoon session at the Pollinator Haven Garden again, where folks can come and kind of have a guided census experience. Um, there are a couple of botanical gardens as well. So the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, um, I know is having a um, an, a public event where there will be um, garden uh, docents who are going to um, be on hand, but you can go to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and participate in the census as well. And they've got um, identification ringlets that people can take with their, their um, families. They've got, um, they're gonna have a map where folks can go and find um, plants that uh, might be particularly active. Um, they've got a separate, they're gonna have a separate scavenger hunt with um, families with small children. And so they've even kind of taken this and like run with it as part of their programs. And for those of y'all who are watching the webinar and do have maybe associated with a botanical garden, I'm happy to send this to you because um, uh, they did a great job. Um, so Susan, uh, Susan Causey asked, regarding sampling what's, what size area should be observed. So again, it's just going to be pick up one plant. Um, if it is a, if it's a large, a very active plant, you're only going to pick one small part of it about the size of a basketball. So, you know, about 12 to 18 inches, something that you can manage visually for 15 minutes. So that's a great question. Um, so somebody asked, what error rate are you expecting in the citizen science data? So it has been the reason that we use this specific protocol. It's It's been kind of cor uh, corrected by the nature of the way the protocol has been designed. Um, so uh, really the importance is making sure people are following the way that the protocol is written and then 
just trying to continue to correct and learn those different pollinators that are being, those pollinator groups that are being observed. So there is a certain amount of like, you know, misidentification, uh, especially with folks who are not, maybe not as familiar with insects, but the more and more people that participate and the more and more people, the volume of people, it kind of corrects itself. So somebody asked, has anyone videotaped their plant and then counted the insects in slower motion on their computer? No one has done that. And that's an interesting uh, concept. I've not thought of that. I don't see why you couldn't necessarily. I think, you know, I think you can just maybe simplify it by picking a, picking a visually manageable area, but that's a very interesting idea. <laughs> So somebody did ask, is this limited to Georgia, North, and South Carolina? And yes, the Great Southeast Pollinator Census in 2023 is only open for data gathered in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Uh, in the future, hopefully, it will be um, available to more people across the Southeast and maybe across the, the country. But right now, it's just in those three states. Now, if you are interested, um, there are multiple citizen science type projects that are going on across the country right now. Um, one, one of the big ones that I use in my programming is iNaturalist, and that is just a picture-based um, citizen science project. You have an app, you can take pictures of plants and animals, lichens, uh, fungi, any kind of living thing upload it to the website and you can get it identified. There is a, a GPS data point that gets associated with it, creates these heat maps of where different organisms exist. And anybody can do that at any time, anywhere in the world. It's a really amazing data set. It's been going since about 2015. And just looking at all the different organisms that they have in their data set, it's just amazing. There's also the Great Southeast or the, the, the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas, which is a new program that um, the Xerxes Society started this year in the Southeast for the first time. It's a little more technical. There's a, a little more of a technical protocol and the, the talking points that Hannah covered in terms of like the, the, the using a sweep net and capturing the insects and trying to get good photos. That's a really big hallmark of that. But that's a great project. And if you really want to challenge yourself scientifically, that is a much more scientifically rigorous um, project. But it's a very cool one. And this is, again, this is actually the first year for the Atlas project as well in the Southeast. Finally, there's a, there's a handful of other ones. I know SciStarter is another big one. And they have, that is a general uh, citizen science finding website and there are several different pollinator sense or pollinator related citizen science programs that you can find on SciStarter. And finally, um, Project Sunflower, um, which is another one more based around plants than anything. But um, so there's lots of different ways if you don't live in North Carolina, South Carolina or Georgia, that you can still start gathering the citizen science data. Is there a place to put your exact location? You will be asked to put your location in when you put your when you put in your data. So great question. So I know that we had a couple of interesting questions, um, technical questions from our uh, panelists while our panelists were talking. So someone asked, um, my echinacea keeps getting aster yellows, so I pull them out and replace them only for it to come back. I see pollinators on them, so can I leave them despite them being diseased? Um, if you're never, if you're not familiar with um, uh, echin aster yellows, um, unfortunately, it's a it's kind of a debilitating disease. Um, there's a bacteria-like organism that actually gets transferred by insects between flowers, and it causes this kind of cancerous-like growth, um, and it turns the flowers yellow to green. The flowers don't form right. Um, and um, and it will eventually kill the plant and kind of make it non-functional, and it can spread to other things in the sunflower family. 
So Denacious uh, answered that one, and she said, so the plants will still be fine for pollinators, but the disease will continue to be spread by leafhoppers. My suggestion would be to stop planting coneflower for a few years so that you can break the cycle. I know that's a tough answer, but I think, but think about the other amazing plants you can grow in its place. And I, I just love that, that question. Someone also um, kind of going back to some of those observations that folks have, um, someone said, I have four varieties of native milkweed, fennel, and many other host plants. And I think she's talking about for caterpillars this year, but I have had fewer monarchs and other butterflies. Why? And Denatia um, contributed, I also have seen far fewer butterflies and I've had zero caterpillars. I don't actually have a scientific answer, but suspect that it is really related to the weather. Uh, research has shown that monarch butterfly migration patterns are negatively impacted by extreme heat. So I su suspect that that's broadly applicable to other butterflies as well. And so I, we've, we've been pretty hot here in North Carolina, but if you think about the extreme weather, extreme heat advisories that have been in place in Alabama and Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, um, a lot of our monarch butterflies are coming into our area through those ways. And so if they get stuck in a heat wave, they may be stuck there, they may die, so they may not make it this far north, or they may be delayed in getting here to North Carolina. Uh, somebody asked, don't bumblebees vary in size in the same species? And that is a great question. And yes, they do. Um, it depends on their gender and their function. Uh, queen bees, uh, even, even, um, more than just honeybees have queen bees. These are the, the, the bees that um, lay eggs and they tend to be larger than, than the males and the other females in the species. Uh, we get a lot of people who get really hung up on um, honeybees and uh, think that honeybees are the representative insect um, for all bee species and, and honeybees are actually very unique. Uh, so somebody asked, are there other species that have large colonies like honeybees that can be raised for commercial pollinization purposes? And um, Hannah, laid in, uh, Hannah weighed in on this. She says, there are not other species that live in colonies as large as honeybees. Honeybees are pretty unique compared to our other bee species. Bumblebees live in colonies of a few hundred individuals that can and have been used in commercial settings. There are also some solitary uh, bees like mason bees that can be produced in large numbers and used in commercial settings. And there are, um, there are companies that um, breed um, bumblebees um, and you can buy small colonies to put in greenhouses. Amanda, um, mm -hmm. there's been a couple of questions about um, people outside of North Carolina and the, the area, which I know we've talked about, but um, people asking, you know, if my grandkids are in Illinois, can they participate? And, um, you know, my suggestion was they could, they could use the materials to go out and count, mm -hmm. but they just wouldn't upload the data. So it's a great way to get, if you have grandkids in another state, you could share the materials with them, then maybe tell them to, to mail their sheets to you, you know, uh, if you live here, but don't, don't put their data up, but it, it's a great way to get them involved in watching pollinators. Definitely. I've been encouraging folks, one of the reasons why I really thought that this was a great program to get behind in North Carolina is because while it does focus around those two sampling dates, so in this year is August 18th and 19th, you can use these materials throughout the year to help if you have classrooms or if you're doing 4-H presentations. It's just a really good protocol and a really good program to learn those scientific methods and those data gathering um, uh, skills and habits. And then uh, you can do it on the day of and you've already prepped for it. So it's, it's, it's just a good program to do year round um, outside of the, the window of sampling. Um, and with that, thank you everyone. Thank you our speakers for being here, Regina and Charlotte for your support and everyone who joined us today. Best of luck on the census next week. Um, I look forward to hearing everybody's stories and seeing the data as it comes in. We should be seeing the results from the data in September. And I promise that I will send that out as soon as Becky sends it to me, we will be sharing all the cool things that y'all observed on August 18th and 19th next week. Best of luck in your censuses. Have a great afternoon. Well, thank you, Amanda, for being such a big part of 
bringing North Carolina into the census or bringing the census to us. <laughs> <laughs> this is excellent. This is excellent. Y'all have a great afternoon. Thank you again. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda.